Yes, well, it seems this plane has crashed. Uh, there's a major search and rescue operation ongoing. It doesn't leave me. My wife and my children's flesh is out there in Ethiopia. It's mixed with the sand. And the jet fuel. And the bottom line here is the 737 MAX is safe. 157 people from more than 30 countries were killed. The Boeing 737 MAX 8. The plane in question was a Boeing 737 MAX 8. The investigation into the Boeing 737 MAX, it was a year ago this week when the second MAX crashed in Ethiopia, killing all on board. And if you today, read descriptions of what it was like to be an engineer at Boeing during the early days, it barely sounds real. It's described as a company that put the engineer's passion for building the best, safest plane above all else, regardless of the cost where employees were truly described as a family, with watertight contracts where managers and pencil pushers aged out gracefully, and designers and engineers ran the show. That Boeing is gone, and with it, their sterling reputation as the best commercial airplane manufacturer in the world. What has replaced it is a culture of cutting corners, pursuing profits and shareholders over safety and engineering. How that shift occurred is a bizarre story of a changing industry and a merger gone wrong that was supposed to allow Boeing to dominate the market and has instead brought about a steady stream of crises, the loss of billions of dollars, and the death of hundreds. Boeing started in 1916 and did what most successful companies in the early 20th century did. They absorbed their competition one by one, until by the 70s they were a massive company, diversified into areas such as space travel, agriculture, energy, and transit. At Boeing, quality was put above all else. Pilots and fans alike would repeat the mantra, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. The Boeing 707, which made its first flight in 1957, was the first successful passenger jet and more or less started the modern era of commercial air travel. Throughout the 60s and 70s, air travel was heavily regulated. Governments granted regional landing access to specific airlines, so specific routes more or less had no competition. That formed a symbiotic relationship between airlines and airplane manufacturers. Boeing's engineers, for example, could add whatever kind of cool bit of engineering they wanted because it made the plane faster or safer, and the airlines would pass the cost on to the consumers through raising ticket prices. That changed in the 80s, as deregulation hoped to increase more competition and reduce prices for consumers. Airlines could no longer pass on the cost of better planes fully to consumers, and as Boeing's cost began to climb, their stock dropped. Boeing's rival, McDonnell Douglas, struggled even more. MD had been a major defense contractor for the US government, but by the mid-90s, their contracts were drying up, and the government largely turned to Boeing or Lockheed Martin. Commercially, things were much worse. By 1996, about 60% of new commercial orders went to Boeing, 35% went to the German company Airbus, and the remaining 5% went to MD. For Boeing, their orders were piling up, and they saw an opportunity to make use of McDonnell Douglas's manufacturing facilities to meet their quotas. Absorbing MD also gave Boeing a chance to further diversify their business, adding MD's expertise and contracts in defense as a way to bring in revenue during the ups and downs of commercial jet travel. All of that together led to a merger between Boeing and McDonnell Douglas that began in 1996. Regulators in both North America and Europe debated whether to allow the deal to go through, since losing McDonnell Douglas would lessen competition in the market. Eventually, they concluded that MD was likely on their way to a collapse anyways, and the merger was completed in 1997. Boeing absorbed their biggest domestic rival, diversified their business, and added to their production capability. Yet, the results of the merger inside Boeing were far from what you would expect. Many McDonnell Douglas executives were given senior positions within Boeing. The CEO of MD, Harry Stonecipher, was appointed COO and held more than twice the number of shares in the company as Boeing CEO, Phil Condit. Harry Stonecipher became Boeing CEO in 2003. In many ways, it appears that Boeing paid $14 billion to sell itself to a competitor that was about to go under. McDonnell Douglas brought with them a very different corporate culture from what Boeing was known for. Engineers stopped running the show. Employees were warned by Stonecipher to stop acting like a family and perform or be removed from the team. 
Phil Condit, the CEO of Boeing at the time of the merger, was already undertaking cost-cutting measures, but the influence of MD's culture took that to another level. Employees struggled to adjust. Many engineers had been around for decades. Their ingenuity and dedication had taken the company into the jet age and were now being asked to stop prioritizing passengers and their passion for great planes and instead focus on shareholders and affordability. In a 2004 interview with the Chicago Tribune, Stone Cipher said, when people say I changed the culture at Boeing, that was the intent. So it's run like a business rather than a great engineering firm. It is a great engineering firm, but people invest in a company because they want to make money. Boeing moved their headquarters to Chicago, separating management and engineers. Instead of cutting costs and becoming more efficient, production slowed. It took six years for Boeing to even announce the intention to build a new plane in the 787 Dreamliner. The 787 and the 737 represent the shift in Boeing both practically and ideologically. Previous to the 787, Boeing engineers designed parts, which were then manufactured by a supplier and delivered to Boeing for assembly into modules and then airplanes. That all changed after the merger. Boeing outsourced 70% of its design, engineering, and manufacturing of full modules to more than 50 partners. Communication and coordination between these partners was poor. Many of them didn't have the adequate experience in at least one of engineering, design, or supply chain management to properly complete the job, resulting in delays, poor quality, and rising costs. The 737 had an original development budget of $5.5 billion. The 787 was three years late and cost more than $32 billion. Both Boeing and Airbus make the majority of their profit from single-aisle jetliners, the Boeing 737 and Airbus A320. Airbus did something surprising. Instead of coming out with a new plane, they expanded the capacity and improved the engines on the A320, launching the A320neo. The A320neo required no additional pilot training while making improvements to the plane. It was a huge commercial success. So much so that American Airlines told Boeing, unless they could match it, a new order of 400 planes was going to Airbus. Boeing pushed to create the 737 MAX and did so on schedule. The MAX became their best-selling plane ever. But internal Boeing messages would later reveal a dark secret behind the MAX. Much of the MAX's success relied upon the fact that pilots would need no additional training, which would keep down costs for airlines who wanted to buy the plane. But it did require additional training. In order to accommodate the larger engines, Boeing moved the position of the engines forward on the wing. This could cause the plane to stall under certain conditions. To combat that, Boeing installed a software fix, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. The MCAS was designed to push the nose of the airplane down under certain circumstances to prevent stalling, relying on a single angle of attack sensor to determine when to activate. Despite being fit with numerous sensors, the AOA didn't cross-reference its information with anything else on the plane. This meant that the AOA could provide incorrect data about when to bring the nose of the plane down, incorrectly triggering the MCAS. Pilots could override the MCAS if they knew it existed. But Boeing employees lied to the FAA under pressure from management, concealing the existence of the MCAS in order to avoid requiring additional pilot training. As such, pilots didn't even know the software existed and had no idea what was happening when it triggered, much less knowing how to turn it off. This resulted in several terrifying minutes for the passenger and crew of two airplanes, one in 2018 and one in 2019, as pilots fought the MCAS, which would trigger in 10 second intervals, giving the pilots five seconds to attempt to right the plane before plunging the nose down once again. I think about my wife a lot. Because she was there with the children. And my mom-in-law. And she knew they were going to die. 346 people died. Hundreds of 737 Maxes were grounded and orders canceled after the crashes. CEO Dennis Muhlenberg was fired and the FAA and US government began investigations into Boeing. In July of 2019, Boeing posted its largest ever quarterly loss. Those investigations found that Boeing had ignored numerous instances where employees had raised concerns about the MCAS and had instead prioritized deadlines and budget over safety and had not disclosed important information to the FAA. 
Boeing was ordered to pay over $2.5 billion after being charged with fraud for hiding information from safety regulators. While you may think that this incident must have turned things around for Boeing, it didn't. In 2020, Boeing debuted the 777X, the largest capacity twin jet ever built, but experienced problems during the test flight. The 777X has since encountered a number of technical problems and is now delayed until 2025, six years after its initial release date. In January of 2024, a door panel blew off of a 737 MAX 9 while in flight, resulting in an emergency landing and several injuries. Four bolts used to secure the panel had been removed at Boeing's factory and not put back on, leading to further questions about Boeing's quality control practices at their factories. And just when people thought nothing else could possibly happen, two months later in March, a Boeing 737 landed in Dallas when the pilots realized the brakes were not working. An investigation revealed that a Boeing maintenance worker had replaced the brakes four days earlier, but accidentally swapped the hydraulic and electrical lines. The pilots managed to use reverse thrusters to slow down, and no one was hurt. In 2019, John Barnett spoke to the BBC about safety concerns he had witnessed at Boeing. Barnett had been a Boeing employee for 30 years, and spent the last seven years of his career as a quality manager at the North Charleston plant. Barnett reported numerous problems, from substandard parts being fitted to airplanes, issues with one in four oxygen masks, and lax procedures on tracking defective components, allowing them to go missing. Despite alerting his managers, Barnett's concerns were dismissed. Barnett was found dead of an alleged self-inflicted gunshot wound in March of 2024 in the middle of a deposition hearing for his case against Boeing. Through fines, settlements, the cost of meeting FAA requirements, and lost revenue from the grounding of hundreds of planes, Boeing has lost billions of dollars over the last several years, ironically, as a result of their attempts to save money. So what is going to happen to Boeing? There are a lot of changes going on in the company. CEO David Calhoun is stepping down, and there's a lot of changeover in upper management. It's going to be a hard few years for Boeing, but overall, the likelihood that Boeing is allowed to fail is next to none. Commercial aviation is a duopoly. Boeing and Airbus are basically the only two companies in the world making large passenger jets. Bombardier attempted to join the party in the late 2010s, but initially were hit by massive tariffs by the United States, and even when those were repealed, they still faced losses of $400 million per year and ended up selling their commercial aircraft business to Airbus. The barrier to entry for the industry is simply too high. Because of that, Boeing and Airbus have found themselves in mutually beneficial relationships with their respective governments. Other than maybe the CEO of Boeing, I don't know anybody who's done more uh, to sell Boeing planes around the world than me. Boeing makes airplanes. They had a big problem with one, but they make the greatest airplanes. They make the best airplanes in the world. Boeing is a top 100 U.S. federal contractor. They're part of the Dow. They spend millions of dollars per year lobbying the U.S. government. They're NASA's biggest contractor, and they're the fourth largest defense contractor in the world. The FAA is only now rethinking its policy of outsourcing some of its oversight to Boeing employees, a move they have made reluctantly because it is likely to slow the rate of production in the American aviation industry and be very expensive and time consuming for the FAA. I'm not suggesting a conspiracy that the FAA and US government will align to keep Boeing operating despite the danger to the public but rather to point out the complicated relationship between Boeing, the FAA, the US government, and the forces of capitalism. The deregulation of aviation in the 80s and 90s was supposed to produce more competition. Competition is supposed to breed innovation. But instead, Boeing's response to competition was to destroy the innovative spirit that made it the top commercial aviation company in the world, inheriting the culture of a rival that was destined to go out of business and racing to make planes as cheaply and quickly as possible. Rather than usher in a new era of success, Boeing has lagged behind Airbus in recent years, almost exclusively because of their issues with safety that have caused their planes to be grounded and production to be halted or slowed while lengthy investigations took place. The future success of Boeing may depend on if they can get in touch with their roots and once again become a company led by a passion for making the best, safest planes in the world. Or whether they will continue to cut corners, losing billions in the process and causing many of us to say, if it's Boeing, I'm not going.